I'm going to talk about Pascal because I think that he is the most effective apologist uh, in the history of philosophy for us moderns. Thus, I entitled my book, from which I will be reading and quoting a lot of Pascal, Christianity for Modern Pagans, Pascal's Pensees Edited, Outlined, and Explained. Pascal lived at the end of the pre-modern era and at the beginning of the modern era. And he's like an amphibian, uh, half uh, in the ocean and half on the land. Uh, he was a contemporary of Descartes, who is called the father of modern philosophy and often the father of the enlightenment. And Descartes' essential project was to do everything by the scientific method, including philosophy. Uh, he formulated the scientific method in a way broad enough to include things like philosophy. And almost every major philosopher for the next 200 years followed Descartes' method, although not necessarily Descartes' conclusions, except one, Pascal. Uh, he's a dissenter. He's different. He's esoteric. He's unique. Uh, there's nobody quite like him until you get to Kierkegaard. Uh, and Kierkegaard is deeply influenced by Pascal. I would call Pascal the father of existentialism because existentialism is the only modern theory of philosophy that's really interesting. Everything else, rationalism and empiricism and materialism and atheism and positivism and Marxism, uh, they're dull. Whether they're true or false or not, they're dull. But existentialism is interesting. Even the atheists like Nietzsche are at least interesting. Uh, and Pascal is interesting. My students find him fascinating. Uh, I often polled my students at the end of a long course that included Pascal, uh, what was their favorite philosopher, and almost always he wins number one rank. He addresses modern man. Uh, modern man is different than medieval man. He doesn't take things for granted. He questions everything. He feels alienated from the cosmos, from objective truth, from his own identity, from certainty. Uh, and that has only increased in the fourth century since Pascal. Uh, and modern students identify with Pascal as they identify with Augustine's Confessions, which is a book that also spans the centuries and is not at all typical of pre-modern thought. The Pensees are a series of notes, about a thousand of them, uh, most of them just single sentences or short paragraphs, about 10 of them a page or more long, that Pascal was planning to organize into a systematic book of apologetics. God, in his mysterious mercy, struck Pascal dead before he turned 40, before he could spoil the book, by ordering them in a perfect outline. So we just have messy little notes. We have beautiful pearls without a string. And there's something more beautiful about pearls without a string than there is about pearls on a string. So everyone wonders just what the uh, order of the Ponces is supposed to be, including me. And I ordered them myself in the way that seems the most reasonable to me uh, and the most Pascalian. Uh, Pascal himself did give us a basic order. There are two parts to the Ponces, and they're the same as the two parts of every basic book of Christian apologetics in the whole history of Christianity. They're the bad news and the good news. He writes, first part, wretchedness of man without God. Second part, happiness of man with God. Pascal was a great scientist himself. He invented the world's first working computer, basically an adding machine, uh, did great work in optics and mathematics and probability theory, invented the vacuum cleaner, uh, the world's first successful public transportation system. He was as great a scientist as Descartes. But his attitude toward science, though respectful, was very different to Descartes. He didn't think it was going to give man wisdom. 
or happiness or certainly salvation. And yet he uses the basic structure of the scientific method in the past in, in the Francais in the very broad sense that the scientific method is essentially gathering data, forming theories, and testing every theory or hypothesis by the data and rejecting all theories that don't cover all the data. In that sense, Pascal is an empiricist. Empirical data, the data of experience, uh, are the standard for judging ideas. And he formulates the data this way. There are four pieces of data, which he claims nothing but Christianity adequately explains. Number one, we desire truth. Number two, we find in ourselves uncertainty. Number three, we seek happiness. Number four, we find in ourselves wretchedness and death. He goes on, we are incapable of not desiring truth and happiness, and we are incapable of either certainty or happiness. Now, what a fascinating koan puzzle that is. In Zen Buddhism, a koan puzzle is an, an unanswerable puzzle, which is meant to destroy ordinary thought and stimulate mystical thought. Uh, there is no answer to a koan. There is an answer to this, but Pascal argues that uh, Christianity is the only adequate answer. Keep that in mind uh, as we go through the details of his argument. Pascal had great respect for reason, yet he also had great respect for paradox or apparent contradictions or things that transcend ordinary reason, as did Augustine. And his fundamental paradox is that man is both great and wretched. Uh, he says man is neither an angel nor a beast. And unfortunately, anyone trying to act the angel acts the beast. He says, and many of these sayings you've probably heard before. Pascal, like Shakespeare, is eminently quotable. Man is only a reed, the weakest thing in nature, but he is a thinking reed. Imagine that, a little blade of grass that can think. There's no need for the whole universe to take up arms to crush him. A vapor, a drop of water is enough to kill him. But even if the universe were to crush him, man would still be nobler than his slayer because he knows that he is dying and the advantage the universe has over him. And the universe knows nothing of this. Back in 1941, when C.S. Lewis had just become famous for the screw tape letters, Time Magazine uh, interviewed him. And the interviewer asked him, uh, among others, this question. There is a rumor that uh, Nazi Germany is going to get an atomic bomb which can destroy an entire city. If the rumor is true, and you saw that bomb dropping on London, and you had only five seconds to think before you realized that everything you loved and knew would be uh, killed forever, what would your last thought be? And Lewis said instantly, I would stick my tongue out at that bomb and say, Pooh, you're only a bomb, I'm an immortal soul. He got that paradox. Since what is noble in us is thought, Pascal says, it is not in space that I must seek my human dignity, but in thought. Through space, the universe swallows me up like a speck. Through thought, I grasp it. How tiny you are, how literally unimaginably tiny you are compared to the rest of the universe. Yet we're the only known thing in the entire universe that can think about the entire universe. Yes, we are wretched, but says Pascal, man's greatness comes from knowing that he is wretched. And all these examples of wretchedness, which we're going to go into in a moment, prove his greatness, for it is the wretchedness of a great lord, of a dispossessed king. Imagine two tramps eating garbage, one is content, the other is discontent. The most likely explanation for the difference is that the contented one never knew anything other than garbage. The discontented one once had good food. Which do we resemble? 
It's not a proof, but it's strong evidence for something like a fall. If we don't unconsciously remember innocence and Eden, why do we long for it? How can we desire something we never experienced? The most quoted and famous parts of the Pensees are the bad stuff, the wretchedness, the examples of wretchedness. And some of them are very funny. Here's one. Anyone who wants to know the full extent of man's vanity, and vanity here doesn't mean like a vanity mirror. It simply means what it means in a book of Ecclesiastes. We can't get what we want. Mick Jagger's wisdom. I can't get no satisfaction, which is the whole point of the confessions, the restless heart. Anyone who wants to know the full extent of man's vanity has only to consider the causes and effects of love. The cause of love is a je ne sais quoi, and I know not what. Why do we fall in love? What psychologist has ever explained why Dante alone fell in love with Beatrice? It was an ordinary plain Jane. Nobody. And the effects of love are terrifying. It upsets the whole earth, princes, armies, the entire world. If Cleopatra's nose had been a quarter of an inch shorter, the whole face of the earth would have been different. Mark Antony would not have fallen in love with her. The Egyptian campaign would not have happened. And Caesar would probably not have uh, transformed the Republic into an empire. Oliver Cromwell was about to ravage the whole of Christendom. He was a very popular dictator. But for a little grain of sand getting into his bladder, it killed him. One grain of sand changed history. Unfortunately, our moral reasons are also often tiny. Imagine, Pascal asks you, two combatants in a war. One says, why are you killing me? I am unarmed. And they reply, why, do you not live on the other side of the river? My friend, if you lived on my side, I would be a murderer. But since you live on the other side, I'm a brave man. And that is right. So justice is determined by where the river flows, where some rock centuries ago happened to divert the water. Pascal does believe in a natural law or an objective moral law of, of, of good and evil, but it is so difficult to know and so rarely obeyed that uh, might and right don't get together. Here's what he says about might and right. As men could not make might obey right, which is a, the, the, the main point of the most popular book in the entire history of philosophy, namely Plato's Republic. Make political power obey philosophical wisdom. Thus the philosopher king. Can't be done. Plato himself tried it in Syracuse. It was a disaster. People hated it. He barely escaped with his life. As men could not make might obey right, they have made right obey might. Mao Zedong is a good example. He said, justice comes out of the muzzle of a gun. As men could not fortify justice, they have justified force. The only other way to get those two things together, that's vanity. Life itself is vanity because a process, a narrative, like an argument, uh, is determined by its ending. And the apparent ending of life is death. Death always wins. Here is Pascal's memorable description of death. Imagine a number of men in chains, all under sentence of death, some of whom are each day butchered in the sight of the others. Those remaining see their own condition in that of their fellows and looking at each other with grief and despair, await their turn. This is an image of the human condition. That's us. Samuel Beckett, the atheistic but very funny existentialist in Waiting for Godot, uh, summarizes the point this way. We give birth astride a grave. The baby pops from womb to tomb. Whether it takes seven seconds or 70 years, that's the beginning and the end, apparently. Pascal notes the one doctrine that 
most non-Christians hate the most, and it's the one that Chesterton says is the most obvious just by reading the newspapers, namely original sin, the fact that our very nature is fallen and selfish, and that our our conscience is always at war with our with our life and our actions and our natures. Uh, and that's our koan puzzle, because as Pascal says, we are born into an obviously unjust situation, or at least blaming God, but that injustice comes naturally to us. We are thus born into an obviously unjust situation. We're, we're all selfish, we all play God, from which we cannot escape, but which we know we must escape. You absolutely have to be good and you can't. That's very strange. How much can philosophical reason do? More than many people think and less than some people think. He has a very balanced view of reason. First of all, the weakness of reason. Reason is not the psychologically strongest power in us. Freud is right there. Most reasoning is rationalizing. And passion is much stronger than reason. Yet neither one can kill the other. Pascal says about reason and passion, the internal war of reason versus the passions has made those who demanded peace split into two sects. Some wanted to renounce passions and become gods like the Stoics. Others wanted to renounce reason and become brute beasts, like the materialists. But neither side has ever succeeded, for reason always remains to denounce the injustice of the passions and to disturb the peace of those who surrender to them. You can't kill your conscience. You can't rip up your moral motherboard. And the passions are always alive in those who want to renounce them. The saints are the clearest ones about that. They are sinners. There's always two halves. Like Augustine, he revels in paradox. On the one hand, on the other hand. Look how great we are. Look how wretched we are. Look how strong reason is. Look how weak reason is. It's even weaker than the imagination. Imagination, he says, is the dominant faculty in man. All the more deceptive for not being invariably deceptive, or if it, if it were infallible, it would be an infallible criterion of error rather than truth. What power dispenses reputation, makes us respect and revere persons, works, laws, and the great faculty of imagination? Would you say that this magistrate of justice, whose venerable age commands respect, is ruled by pure sublime reason and judges things as they really are? without paying heed to the trivial? See him go to hear a sermon in the spirit of pious zeal, the soundness of his judgment strengthened by the ardor of his charity, ready to listen with exemplary respect. If when the preacher appears, it turns out that nature has given him a squeaky voice and an odd face, and that his barber has shaved him badly, and he happens to be not too clean, then whatever great truths he may announce, I wager that our just senator will not be able to keep a straight face. Put the world's greatest philosopher on a plank that is wa as wide as need be. If there is a precipice below it, though his reason convinces him that he is perfectly safe, his imagination will prevail. This is one of the reasons why the decline of Christianity in the last few generations is dependent not so much on argument or science or even morality, uh, as on the imagination and the arts. We're fascinated by beauty. Pascal says, we have an incapacity for proving anything with absolute certainty, which incapacity no amount of dogmatism can overcome. You think you know something certain? I have a little pin here. Let me let me touch your balloon with the pin and see what happens. We also have an idea of truth which no amount of skepticism can overcome. There's no such thing as a complete skeptic. A skeptic believes that skepticism is true. Well, then you believe in truth, and you're not a skeptic. 
So both dogmatism and skepticism fail, fall. Another paradox, another unsolvable koan puzzle. One of the most frequently mentioned points of Pascal's meditation on human vanity and wretchedness uh, is distinctively modern. And we find this in no other culture except our own, our own Western modern and postmodern culture, namely our relationship to nature. We don't fit nature. We don't fit into the universe. We're, we're naturally alienated. Uh, the fact that it is so big and we are so small uh, didn't alienate pre-modern man. I remember teaching a class that contained a couple of Harvard students, and we read Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy, in which he quotes the astronomer everyone read in the Middle Ages who uh, couldn't read at all, namely Ptolemy, about the size of the universe. And he said it is unimaginably large and the earth is smaller than a pinprick compared with the entire universe. And these Harvard students says that can't be right. We were taught that uh, uh, this was only discovered in, in modern times and that every ancient culture felt that the universe was quite small and cozy. Uh, and I replied, well, here's the data. Not true, sorry. But that immense disproportion between our tininess and the universe's vastness did not cause alienation to Boethius or anyone in the Middle Ages. It does to the modern world. Why? And then when we look at how large we are compared with the microscopic, we find another disproportion. Pascal offers a little thought experiment which I think a couple of science fiction writers have followed up on. Imagine each subatomic particle, which in Pascal's day was thought to be the atom, is not indeed literally an atom, which means not cuttable, but is cuttable into parts. In fact, is so cuttable into parts that it is an entire universe. And imagine our entire universe, big as it seems to us, is only an atom in another universe forever. We don't know that that's not true. We do know that we don't fit. There's no nice definable place out there and a nice definable place in here, which, which fit, we're, we're disproportionate. In time as well as space, we can't find a, a, a resting place. He says, we seem to be floating, drifting, uncertainly, blown to and fro. Wherever we think we have a fixed point to which we can cling and make fast, it shifts and leaves us behind. If we follow it, it eludes our grasp, slips away, and flees before us. Nothing stands still for us. That's typically modern. This is our natural state, yet it is a state most contrary to our inclinations. We burn with desire to find some firm footing on which to build a tower rising up to infinity. But all foundations crack and the earth opens up into the depths of the abyss. My students identify with that, that feeling. What could be more natural than nature and our nature? And yet it seems unnatural. Well, this is not only a, a, a very small portion of the bad news, uh, because I've already taken up almost half the time. But before we get to the good news and the weight of the good news, the two sections of Pascal's Pensees that rightly stun the hearts of typically modern students the most are the two most popular and typical answers to this problem of wretchedness and alienation and uncertainty. One of them is called diversion. The other is called indifference. Despite all these afflictions, Pascal says, 
We want to be happy. We only want to be happy. We cannot help wanting to be happy. But how shall we go about it? The best thing would be to make ourselves immortal. But since we cannot do that, we have decided to stop ourselves from thinking about it. But you can't just stop yourself from thinking about it. You have to divert yourself with something else. If I say to you, I forbid you to think of a red dragon, what's your response? You're thinking of a red dragon. In the very act of shoving it out of your mind, you put it in your mind. So I have to say, think of a blue mastodon. Well, that might shove out the red dragon. Here is his most famous pensé on diversion. And uh, I designed a, a thought experiment for students to write an essay about, which always produces fascinating results. He starts this way. Sometimes when I set to thinking about the various activities of men, the dangers and troubles which they face at court or in war, giving rise to so many quarrels and passions, such daring and often wicked enterprises and so on, I have often said that the sole cause of man's unhappiness is, I remember when I first read that, I blotted out the rest of the sentence. And I said, I'm going to guess that Pascal will say something like, he has forgotten God or something equally pious. And then I took my hand away and I read these words, that he does not know how to stay quietly in his room. Well, I say to my students, if you find that insulting, do this little thought experiment. Decide to stay quietly alone by yourself in your room with nobody else there and no diversions and no distractions for one hour. Uh, no books, no screens, nothing but yourself. Uh, if you can't do that in an ordinary room, go into the room that probably has no windows or a bathroom. And um, if uh, noise disturbs you, put a noise machine there, but uh, just get acquainted with yourself. See how easy it is. Almost always, whether they begin by thinking it's going to be easy or whether they begin by thinking it's going to be difficult, uh, they learn that it's much more difficult than they think. One of them said, if the most boring person I ever met was with me in that room for that hour, I'd be far less bored. Does that mean I find myself more boring than the most boring person I ever met? I found that really threatening. Man is so unhappy, writes Pascal, that he would be bored even if he had no cause for boredom by the very nature of his temperament. And he is so vain that though he has a thousand and one basic reasons for being bored, the slightest thing like pushing a ball with a billiard cue will be enough to divert him. Gambling, which Pascal in his early days uh, was adept at, uh, is an example of boredom. All, all sports is, is a kind of gambling translated into the physical world. Uh, playing with uncertainty. He explores the psychology of gambling. Uh, and it's not just about gambling. It's about much of life. It's about diversions. A given man lives a life free from boredom by gambling a small sum every day. Give him every morning all the money he might win that day, but on the condition that he does not gamble. You will not make him happy. You will make him unhappy. It might be argued then that what he wants is the entertainment of gambling and not the winnings. All right, then make him play for nothing. His interest will not be fired. He'll become bored. So it is not just entertainment that he wants either. A half-hearted entertainment without danger or excitement will bore him. He must delude himself into imagining that he would be happy to win the sum that he would not want as a gift if it meant giving up gambling for it. He must create some artificial target for his passions and then arouse his desire and anger and fear for this object that he has created. Very much like children taking fright at a mask that they have made themselves. Hmm why we're fascinated with horror movies. 
how many of the things in our life are diversions that we don't really need, but we use to, to stay sane. So we don't ever meet that empty room, that boredom. Most sociologists know that uh, suicide peaks during vacation times, like Christmas vacation or summer vacation, when ordinary diversions pass away. If you asked yourself this question, how many of the things in my life are really necessary? They are either physically necessary, like food, or morally necessary, like duties. Uh, not too many. Well, what about the others? Why not throw them away? Why not simplify? Once in a while, uh, a narrative, uh, a whole book, uh, centers around a single word. The reason why E.T. is such a great movie is that wonderful, uh, very sad word of E.T., home. And the word that uh, uh, that I'm looking for here, uh, I lost it. Look, look how, how vain, how vain philosophers are. They have a brilliant point, and the whole point of the joke it's gone. Why? That's the mind. Pascal says flies are wiser than philosophers because a fly buzzing around a philosopher's ears will confuse him. But a philosopher buzzing around a fly's ears will not confuse it. Even worse than diversion is indifference. The immortality of the soul, whether it is true or false, says Pascal, is something of such great importance to us that one must have lost all feeling not to care about knowing the facts of the matter. All our actions and thoughts must follow such different paths according to whether there is any hope of life after death or not. And this is why, among those who are not convinced either way, I make an absolute distinction, not between those who believe and those who do not, but between those who strive with all their might to learn the truth and those who live without troubling themselves or thinking about it. I can feel nothing but compassion for those who sincerely lament their doubt, who sparing no effort to escape from it, make this search their principal occupation. But as for those who spend their lives without thought for the final end of all of life, and who, solely because they do not find within themselves the light of conviction, neglect to look and to examine whether this opinion is one of those which people accept out of naivete, or one of those which, though mysterious in themselves, nevertheless have a solid foundation. As for them, I view them very differently. This negligence in a matter where there all is at stake fills me with irritation, not pity. It appalls me. It seems monstrous. I do not say this prompted by the pious zeal of spiritual devotion. I mean, on the contrary, that we ought to have this feeling from principles of human interest and self-esteem. Imagine someone arguing this way. I don't know who put me into this world. I do not know what I am myself. I do not know what it is in me which thinks what I am saying. I find myself attached to one little corner of this vast universe without knowing why I've been put here rather than elsewhere, or why the brief span of life allotted to me should be assigned to one moment rather than another of all the eternity which went before and all that which will come after. All I know is that I must someday die. But what I know least about is this very death, which I cannot evade. As I do not know whence I came, so I do not know whither I am going. All I know is that when I leave this world, I shall fall forever into either nothingness or into the hands of a God whom I have made my enemy. And I do not know which of these two states is to be my eternal lot. And my conclusion from this is that I shall pass my days without a thought of seeking what has to happen to me. So that I will go without fear or foresight to face so momentous an event and allow myself to be carried off limply to my death. 
uncertain of my future state for all eternity. Pascal comments, it is glorious for religion to have such unreasonable men as their enemies. Pascal says there's three kinds of people in the world. There are those who have sought God and have found it, and they are reasonable and happy. Reasonable because they've sought God, happy because they found him. And then there are those who have sought God and have not found him. And they are reasonable because they're seeking. They're not yet believers. They haven't found him, so they're unhappy. And then thirdly, those who are neither reasonable nor happy. Not reasonable because they haven't sought God and not happy because they haven't found him. And they're not only unhappy, they're unreasonable. The difference between heaven and hell, says Pascal, is not between those who have found God and those who haven't. It's between those who have sought him and those who haven't. In other words, it's the heart which seeks rather than the mind which finds that determines our eternal salvation. An atheist who seeks God will find God saying, I said all who seek find. A theist who has never sought God will get the same message. This art that Pascal talks about is famous because probably the single most quoted pensee is the heart has its reasons, which the reason does not know. And this is almost always misinterpreted as a justification of sentimentalism or reliance on feeling. It says exactly the opposite. The heart has reasons. The heart has an eye in it. And we all know this when we turn from science to human relationships. The heart does not have an eye when it examines inhuman things. You don't need to love a subatomic particle in order to understand it. You do need to love a human being in order to understand him. Who knows you best? Your brilliant psychologist who sees you as a case study uh, of one or another pathology, or your best friend who's not nearly so bright or educated, but who would give his life for you. The relation between the head and the heart is a double one. Obviously, the head should enlighten the heart, but unless the heart fuels the head, that's not going to happen. Pascal says, truth is so obscured nowadays, and lies are so well established, that unless we love the truth, we shall never find it. That's especially true in, in our day, which has a radical mistrust of, of all truth claims. See, what am I looking for? Here it is. This explains, this principle explains why God hides. Here's one of the great mysteries of religion. Why, why doesn't God reveal himself more clearly? If you were God and you wanted the whole human race to know you and to love you and be saved, uh, why not more miracles? Why didn't Jesus hang around for 2,000 years more? There wouldn't be too many atheists. Here is why God hides. Here is why we, we need the heart, not just the head, to find him. Wishing to appear openly to those who seek him with all their heart, and wishing to remain hidden from those who shun him with all their heart, God has qualified our knowledge of him by giving signs which can be understood by those who seek him and not by those who do not. Thus, there is enough light for those who desire the truth and enough darkness for those of the opposite disposition. So that what gets you to heaven is not passing a theology test or native intelligence. It's your love. St. John of the Cross famously said, in the evening of, of your life, you will be judged by love. If there were no obscurity, we would not feel our corruption. If there were no light, we would not hope for a cure. Thus, it is useful for us that God should be partly concealed and partly revealed, for it is equally dangerous for us to know God without knowing our own wretchedness, or to know our wretchedness without knowing God. 
when you wonder about why God does something or why Jesus says something, uh, the hard passages of the scripture, those are sometimes the most precious things. Like when you're hunting, you don't look in the open plain for, for game. You look in thickets, you look in hiding places. That's where the most delicious food is. So God deliberately uh, gives us some obscurity. Well, in this situation, uh, what does Pascal say to the unbeliever who has not been seduced by diversion and indifference, who is looking but can't honestly say, I believe? He looks at the arguments for the existence of God, and they're strong arguments, but they're not conclusive. Uh, I myself think that Thomas Aquinas's five ways work. And there's nothing wrong with them. There's no fallacy in them. I've read a number of philosophers who think there are fallacies there, and I think I can answer them all. But I would not honestly risk my salvation on that. If God said uh, to me, you can go to heaven if you can disprove every possible objection to every possible argument for the existence of God. Well, I think I can refute all the objections that I've heard of, all the arguments that I've heard of, but I I wouldn't say, well, yes, I, I would do that. How arrogant. So what do you do? Well, Pascal has an answer that is paradoxically similar to uh, a form of diversion, namely gambling. He had a conversion, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, that brought him into a much deeper relationship to Christ and to the church. And before that conversion, he was a great wagerer. So he uses his foolish lifestyle as an image of uh, a reasonable thing. He argues that we have two things to stake, two amounts of, of, of cash or value, our head and our heart. The head seeks truth, the heart seeks happiness. All right, it's as if we're playing two games. Uh, one for the blue chips, one for the red chips. The blue chips symbolize the cool truth of the head, and the red chips symbolize the uh, the passion of the heart. That's very Augustinian, by the way. Medieval statues of Augusta always have a burning heart in one hand and an open book in the other hand. All right, suppose, suppose you look at the evidence in an unprejudiced way, and you say, well, yes, there is strong argument for the existence of God, but they're not conclusive. There's also a strong argument against the existence of God. The problem of evil, the apparent disorder. If you were God, couldn't you make a better universe? Couldn't you run life a little better than you do? So there's evidence on both sides. So what do you do? Well, that's all blue chip stuff. What about the, the, the red chip stuff? Let us then examine this point. And let us say, either God exists or he does not. Those are the only two possibilities. Fine. To which alternative shall we be inclined? Reason alone cannot decide this question with certainty. At the far end of the infinite distance between us and God, at the far end, which is death, a coin is being spun which will come down heads or tails. Either you see that there is a head, a God behind it all, or you see that, no, it's tails, there isn't any. But we're not dead yet. So before you die, how must you wager? Reason cannot force you to choose either. Reason cannot disprove either. Well, then why not agnosticism? Why not just say I'm an honest skeptic? Do not condemn as wrong those who have made a choice for you, you have no certainty about it. And then he imagines his interlocutor is replying, no, but I condemn them not for having made this choice to believe or not to believe, but to make any choice. For although the one who calls heads and the one who calls tails are equally at fault, the fact is that they are both at fault. The right thing is not to wager at all. And now comes the point that many existentialists have, have emphasized. 
but you must wager. There is no choice. You are already embarked. Embarked. You're on a ship. It's moving. It's got a finite amount of fuel. It wants its own true port. And it doesn't know whether that's atheism or theism. And the fuel is going to run out soon. And that's called death. So you must, since you're already committed, you're already embarked, you're already moving, you must choose one or the other. Since the choice must be made, let us see which choice offers you the least interest. You have two things to lose, the true and the good. Two things to stake, your reason and your will, your knowledge and your happiness. Your nature has two things to avoid, error and wretchedness. Since you must choose, your reason is not affronted by choosing either one rather than the other. What about your happiness then? Let us weigh up the gain and the loss involved in calling heads that God does exist. Let us assess the two cases. You either win or you lose. If you win, you win everything. If you lose, you lose nothing. Do not hesitate then. Wager that he exists. It's the best bet in the world. Now that's very crude. That's selfish and calculating. And God is sometimes very crude. He comes down to our level. Read the Old Testament, a lot of shouting and screaming, like a parent with a, a retarded child, us. Obviously, God is not going to be satisfied with the wager, but it's the beginning. The fear of hell is a, a, a powerful scare tactic. It's very low. Jesus used it against the Pharisees. What harm can come to you from choosing this course? Of belief. You will be faithful, honest, humble, grateful, full of good works, a sincere, true friend. True, you will not enjoy some noxious pleasures and good living, but will you not have many others? I tell you that you will gain even in this life, and that every step you take forward along this road, you will see that your gain is so certain and your risk is so negligible that in the end you will have realized that you have wagered on something infinite for which you have paid almost nothing. Here are two lottery tickets. One is worth nothing. One is worth $10 million. Would you pay me a dollar for the, uh, uh, the chance to pick one of the two blindfold? Of course. Pascal is very close to skepticism, but he says the wager is the most certain thought he's ever had. And then where do you go with the wager? It's not just a me and Jesus thing. He's a Catholic. You go to the church. He says a lot of things about the Catholic Church. He had a uh, rather stormy relationship with the church. He favored the Jansenist heresy for a while until the church condemned it, and then he abandoned it. His beloved sister was a Jansenist. Uh, he uh, had a very low opinion of the Jesuits. He wrote a, a rather bitter satire on them, called the Provincial Letters. It's rather technical and theological, but... Uh, uh, he realized that the church is full of uh, uh, fools and scoundrels. But the church is Christ, his very body. He calls the church a, a, a body of thinking members. We are the members, not of a club, but of a body. Christ and us are a single body, a single blood, divine life flows through uh, the trunk and the, and the leaves or the branches of a tree. It's a profoundly Catholic sense. And his relationship to Christ changed radically when he had his conversion experience, a miraculous or mystical experience, which like all true mystical experiences could not be put into words. He describes it this way. And this was the ponce that he carried with him all the time. He sewed it into his jacket pocket. Notice how exact and scientific it is and how specific it is. The year of grace, 1654, Monday, 23rd of November, Feast of St. Clement, Pope and Martyr and others in the Martyrology, from about half past 10 in the evening until half past midnight. And then comes the operative word, fire. 
Our God is a consuming fire. Not the fire of hell that destroys. It's the opposite kind of fire. It's the fire that, that burned the bush without destroying it. Fire. And he says, God of Abraham, God of Jacob, not the God of the philosophers and scholars. God of Jesus Christ. And in light of that, it says that the four most important questions in the world have a single answer. Question one, who are you? Question two, who is God? Question three, what is life? Question four, what is death? He says, not only do we only know God through Jesus Christ, that's Christ's own claim, but we only know ourselves through Jesus Christ. He alone is true man, perfect man, as well as perfect God. And we only know life and death through Jesus Christ. Apart from Jesus Christ, we cannot know the meaning of our life or of our death or of God, or of ourselves. Pascal is a very sophisticated, very open, very complex, very semi-skeptical kind of person. Yet here is his absolute certainty and his absolute simplicity. Like Augustine, you know, you know where his heart is. His head is everywhere, but his heart is somewhere. His heart is with Christ, and that's the whole meaning of life. And after reading the rest of the Ponsets and admiring Pascal's vast array of, of, of paradoxes and, and arms stretched into both greatness and wretchedness and other paradoxes, you're amazed that it comes to this very simple, very concrete answer to all possible questions. He's finally found the center of everything. And even students who haven't found that center and who are skeptical of those who claim that center, I find are much more sympathetic to Pascal's uh, experiential or existential uh, or heart-centered theology uh, than they are to even good, merely philosophical arguments. Pascal says, yes, philosophy is worth a bit of trouble, about half an hour. Thomas Aquinas said about his own philosophy, which to my mind is the greatest human achievement in history, uh, that it's all straw. Thomas Aquinas, straw. You know what straw was used for in the Middle Ages? To cover animal dung. It's a joke. Pascal too has a great sense of humor. And I guarantee that if you read the Ponsets, you will laugh and weep which are perhaps the two most precious things that an author can give you. All right, that's all I have to say, except now starts the really interesting part, the Q&A. All right, let's start with this one from Kelly. This is a, a great question, doctor. Um, would you say, would Pascal say, that a refusal to make a choice, um, that is indifference, is it equal to choosing against God? Certainly. Uh, Romeo comes to Juliet and proposes uh, marriage and elopement, and Juliet has three possibilities: yes, or no, or I don't know. Wait, come back, come back tomorrow. He comes back tomorrow. Are you ready now? Wait, come back tomorrow. Eventually, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow ends in death. Thank you. This this uh, next one uh, is coming in. There's, there's a couple along these lines. Um, just asking about. Uh, is accusations of Jansenism. You mentioned that he briefly, you know, held uh, held some of these views. Um, his sister was a Jansenist. Could you unpack what that means and maybe what his status, um, if anybody, you know, levels that charge against him, what, what you would say? The essence of Jansenism is the denial between commandments and councils. Uh, we don't all have to be saints. Uh, there is a difference between a minimum and a maximum. And as a Jansenist, Pascal so emphasized the maximum and was so irritated at Jesuit minimalism that he concluded that the Jesuits had transformed Christianity into a different kind of religion. 
Now, we're all encouraged to uh, shoot for the maximum, not for the minimum. But we're also encouraged to be very versatile, versatile and compassionate to others and to ourselves when we fail. Jason here up on screen. Go ahead and unmute yourself and jump in here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kraft, I guess my question would be, um, would Pascal say that you can reach intellectually the concept of a God, but that it takes the wager to accept the idea of a personal God? I don't know, because the wager is about the God of Christianity. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say anything about the God of any other religion, except uh, he has a very high view of the Jews, unusual in his day, and is adamant that uh, the God of the Jews is the God of, of Jesus Christ. In fact, the Jews are our fathers in the faith. They told us who God was. I don't know what he'd say about something like Hinduism. You could imagine it, but uh, he doesn't give you that answer. Sure, thank his, you. His audience, his audience is not uh, an audience of uh, world religion scholars. It's an audience of Christians, ex-Christians, or anti-Christians. Thank you. Doctor, a uh, number of people also asking questions about the wager. Um, it seems to maybe many moderns that it is somewhat uh, obsolete or unconvincing. Could you talk a little bit more about uh, maybe the follow-up to it or maybe what it's not? What is, the, what is it not trying to do? It is not a purely rational argument that has no element of faith or trust in it. When you wager something, you give up something. Here, here is uh, uh, $10, I'm putting it in the lottery, maybe I'll win a million. You don't get that $10 back. When you put your money in the bank, uh, it's something like uh, the lottery, except that the bank promises that it'll give you back, but maybe not. Maybe uh, a war will come. That's why uh, the word that we use for a bank is a trust company. And the, first, uh, and the church is actually the first supernatural bank and trust company. I love it. I love it. Uh, Bob, kind of following up on, on questions about the wager, Bob asks, what is to be said about those who absolutely believe in the existence of God, but say they do not need religion, such as Catholicism, and maybe they pray on their own? What, 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 you know, what's the next step for somebody like that? Well, I think Pascal would say that the error that such a person is making is one of pride. I, I don't need organized religion. Organized religion is a crutch. I'm not a cripple. And Pascal would say, yes, you are. And Christ himself offers himself as, as our crutch. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, let's take another one on screen here. Uh, Christina, go ahead. Thank you for your talk. Um, I've been questioned by many teenagers, either in my teaching classes or things like that, where they use the analogy of how, why would a good God put us in a video game and force us to play by the rules of the game? And, you know, they use that video game analogy. And I have been incapable. How might Pascal, a lot of what he's saying seems to be seems to fit that kind of idea of being like smushed into something or something being imposed on you. How I'm might he I'm that? amazed at the question because the impression I get from Pascal is exactly the opposite. It's not a neat system. It's not a game. It's mm -hmm. terribly serious and it's scary. It's discombobulating. Uh, the philosopher Robert Nozick, uh, who was an agnostic, I believe, said we all have to face the possibility that someday artificial intelligence will be so great that they can make uh, an artificial world uh, that is much better than this one. No downers, no boredom, no pain, no suffering, no fear. Uh, somehow you can, you can step into this machine or, or this genetic treatment, uh, and you'll be happy forever. Would you do it? Uh, you won't live in the real world. You'll live in a video game, but it's a perfect video game. Would you rather know the truth and suffer, 
or would you rather avoid all your sufferings by turning your life into a video game? I think Pascal would love that. He would say, if, if you don't answer, give me the truth, you're not an honest person. And God demands honesty. Certainly, honest atheists will get to heaven much more quickly than dishonest theists. God is not only love, God is truth. So when you trash truth, you're trashing God, even though you don't believe in God. Dr. Tom writes in asking, uh, well, writing, it sounds especially at the end that Pascal has a more limited view as to philosophy's utility for life. Mm -hmm. How much should we worry about studying philosophy as opposed to living life in the church through prayer and the sacraments? Well, even limited things are good things. Your right hand is very limited. Would you like somebody to cut it off? You don't need it. Philosophy is not theology, and theology is not uh, sanctity, uh, and sanctity is not yet heaven. But uh, each one of those things is, is useful, even, even the lowest. Philosophy is certainly more important than science. It gives you wisdom. Science doesn't give you wisdom. It gives you knowledge and power. So philosophy is... Well, let's say there's a level of 20 things. Philosophy is on the fourth level. <laughs> Heaven is the top. Earthly sanctity is, is next. Uh, philosophical wisdom is next. Science is maybe fourth or fifth. Honest science is, is very noble. Search for truth about God's creation. But it's not as great as philosophy, and philosophy is not as great as theology. Because philosophy it. limits itself to what can be proved by human reason. Theology doesn't. Thank you. That that's that's great. That's that's fantastic. It, yeah, an ordering and a hierarchy of goods, but goods nonetheless. And um, video games are not in the top ten. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, doctor, would, Paula asks. You know, again, going back to the wager, why couldn't you use? Pascal's wager to prove any religion should be believed in. Um, you know, for example, that we should believe in a green monster just in case, uh, for instance. Well, that's a good question. And Pascal doesn't answer that because he doesn't deal with other religions. But I think if Pascal, for instance, were a Muslim and dealing with Muslims, uh, some of whom believed in Allah and some of them who didn't, he would use something very much like the wager. But then if the Muslim said, yeah, but this is other religion called Christianity. What would he do? Well, he might use the wager this way. In which of those two cases does it make the biggest difference? It would also say, uh, where does the probable evidence lie? Here, if I'm at Boston College teaching and somebody says, I just read Pascal's wager and uh, uh, he's arguing that uh, since you don't know whether God exists or not, since that's the most important thing, leave everything and just stake everything on him. Well, uh, if the most important person in your life is your wife and your wife is at home now, and it might be true that the house is on fire, and if you left this class and sped to the house, uh, you might save her life. It's not likely, but it's possible. Shouldn't you do that? What are you doing here at Boston College? Instinctively, you say, no, that's a misuse of the wager. That, that doesn't work that way. You can't calculate that way. You have to take into account reasonable possibilities. So crazy religions like worshiping an asteroid uh, wouldn't come under the wager. And the religions that have lasted in the world and are influential in the world are certainly less than 12. There's Christianity, Judaism, Islam, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, Jainism, Sikhism. Uh, that's about it. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Dis, so Tom asks, does Pascal include anything about miracles in his defense? Yes. Uh, how foolish not to believe in miracles. If God created the world, can't he do miracles? If he banged out the big bang, can't he bang out little bangs? He's rather impatient for those who just don't believe in miracles. Walter asks, Pascal says, nothing stands still for us. Hmm. What about Christ or, and, and our knowledge of God through the word? Is he you know, implying that Catholic dogma is monolithic? No. He says, imagine 
you're on board ship and uh, everything on that ship is moving, but your vision is limited to the ship and you seem to be standing still on the ship with these other passengers, but the whole ship, humanity, keeps moving. And then you look and you see that the whole ship is moving and there's nothing certain. And then you see that there's, there is something certain out there. There's land. Well, Christ is like the land and uh, the ocean is like time and the ship is like a culture and you're an individual in that culture. And most people don't have a transcultural view. They, they, they say, I'm just where everybody else is. I'm fine. But maybe everybody else is going to hell in a handbasket. So you have to have a transcultural view to, uh, to evaluate a culture. Which is why he's so enamored of the Jews. Culturally, they're unique. They, they have survived more than anyone. Their law is the, uh, the best and the oldest and uh, something unique about the Jews. He, he he lived in an age of a lot of anti-Semitism, and he would say that it's, it's not surprising. It's, it's envy, it's jealousy. Here's something clearly transcultural, which, which criticizes all cultures. It's very significant that in the early church, Jews and Christians uh, often together uh, were uh, offered up in the Colosseum because they alone uh, had something above Caesar. They would not call Caesar Lord. They had a higher Lord. It's fascinating. Thank you. Uh, Mary asks what you would say, maybe expanding on some things you've already said, what would you say to the scoffer who says that God is mean or essentially playing hide and seek unnecessarily with us? Why not give us more conclusive evidence of his existence? That's a good question. Bertrand Russell uh, on his deathbed supposedly uh, was confronted by a preacher who said, uh, Bertie, you know you're going to die soon. Uh, suppose there is a God. Suppose you meet him. What would you say? And Russell said, I would say, why didn't you give us more evidence? It's an honest question. C.S. Lewis wrote an entire novel about that. It's his best book, Till We Have Faces. The fundamental question is, why must holy places be dark places? Why does God hide? Well, uh, I read... Uh, Pascal's answer to that, some of the answers, to show us our own state as well as who he is, and to motivate the heart to seek and not just the head. Uh, but in a sense, he has to hide, because if he showed himself uh, as he really is to us, we couldn't endure it. We would be like a, a, a flea in a volcano. Uh, there's that wonderful uh, Piece in the Old Testament where Elijah uh, asked to see God, and God says, uh, you cannot see my face. Moses is the only person who ever saw God's face and lived, uh, but I'll show you my backside. And uh, there was, uh, was this, am I confusing or, or conflating two occasions? Uh, there was a fire, and God was not in the fire. There was an earthquake, and God was not in the earthquake. And then there was a still small voice and Elijah hid his face from it. Because that still small voice is the voice of God and you cannot meet God face to face until you get a face. There's something about his immense power being revealed in the smallness, you know, descending yes. to the virgin and it, it, hidden away in a cave. And yeah, it's beautiful. This is why I think John Paul II says something about this. He's the one who added the five uh, luminous mysteries to the rosary. It's fitting that the Eucharist comes after the transfiguration. Because mm. here's the greatest and the humblest manifestation. God in a piece of bread. That's wonderful. Uh, uh, here's a uh, here we'll take maybe a couple more here and then close out um, this one from Cecilia she asks what do you think Pascal would say to those individuals who think religion was invented in the past to explain what science explains satisfactorily now well science doesn't explain religion but religion explains science uh, the idea that religion is just primitive science misunderstands both science and religion. They ask different questions. Uh, science doesn't ask ultimate questions. Uh, even 
even the clues that point to God that are revealed by science, such as Big Bang cosmology, which uh, uh, refutes steady state theory, which all the atheists used to believe, doesn't prove God. It just points in that direction. Uh, and the only thing that science can say about religion is what's based on scientific observation. Religious people are, are often fools and hypocrites and criminals. Yeah, that's true. And so are non-religious people, but that argument goes nowhere. And even if we found a religious gene or a religious uh, part of the brain, which if you shut down, there would be no faith, um, that proves nothing. We're body, mind, unities. We're not angels trapped in, in, in animal bodies. So that's exactly what we would expect on the religious hypothesis. And if religious people behave very, very badly uh, and uh, are, are not at all a credit to their God, uh, doesn't that refute religion? No, that's what God himself says. That's part of the hypothesis itself. Fantastic. Doctor, we'll close with, I'll give you two questions that are that are kind of along the lines of what's next. Um, so the first, uh, which translation of the Ponces would you recommend? And Real then, say that again? Braille Shimers. Um, and then, so the second would be a little more open-ended from Dave um, asking, besides Pascal, who would you consider to be uh, a potent modern apologist? Kierkegaard, John Henry Newman, G.K. Chesterton, and C.S. Lewis. Doctor, thank you for sharing that with us uh, this evening. You're very welcome. God could you, you. Would you, would you mind closing us in prayer tonight? Yes. God, remove our foolish thoughts and send your angels into our minds to substitute your thoughts and above all into our hearts so that our loves may be your loves and that our will may be your will uh, in our education, in our ordinary lives, uh, in our life and in our death and in all things. In Jesus' name, amen.